Imagine a river in the sky carrying vast amounts of water vapor equivalent to what some sources say could be 25 times the flow of the Mississippi River, surging through the atmosphere and unleashing torrents of rain when it makes landfall. Have you heard of these? If not, you're going to Google it. It's interesting. These are atmospheric rivers, powerful weather phenomena that can bring life-sustaining precipitation to drought-stricken areas or floods and landslides to others. It's not good news. And to talk about this issue today and what's going on in the world around us, I welcome Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner with ISSA and Doug Hoffman with Normie. Gentlemen, always a pleasure. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Great to be here. Good to have you both. Gavin, let's start with you. What are you seeing out there that's happening as far as interesting storms or deadly storms that we need to know about? Yeah, this is really important for people to understand, Jeff, that um, California storms can be just as intense and destructive as hurricanes in the southeast and the south of the U.S. Um, wet buildings can lead to microbial contamination and growth. Now, we know in the past 25 years, all 58 counties in California have experienced at least one significant flood event. And we know that more than 7 million Californians, that's one in every five residents, lives in an area at risk of flooding. But what happened two weeks ago, Jeff, as you said, this atmospheric river or this bomb cyclone that, that hit California broke records. Um, the storm brought to Sonoma County three times its normal November rainfall. The storm dumped 12.47 inches of rain in three days in Santa Rosa. That qualifies it as a thousand year rain event. And so we have to remember wet buildings lead to microbial contamination growth. But more importantly, preparedness, Jeff. Preparedness for disasters should include the anticipation of internal event events as well as external events in order to ensure the best response when disasters occur. So through the, the Normie ISSA Alliance Agreement, we are focusing on helping people find the right resources, not just after hurricanes, but also after these huge, massive California storms. Thank you, Gavin. Now, Doug, I know your team at Normie is always ready. You do training, support, you're there to help. What are your thoughts about what's happening right now? Well, I want to really underscore what Dr. Gavin said about preparedness. I think oftentimes folks don't even think about this until after the fact, and then they say, now what do I do? Um, we, of course, have made available uh, through our task force, uh, flood.normie.org, hurricane.normie.org, short videos and help folks think in terms of preparing for what, what's inevitable. And then I think giving them the tools that they need and the training that they need to not only deal with the problem, but maybe supervise the work to make sure that it's done correctly. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened to us, uh, Jeff, after Hurricane Katrina, we were doing a training, actually doing it in my house because there were no hotels available. But half of the people that attended our training, and that was a licensing class, were homeowners. They weren't going to get licensed. They weren't going to get certified, but they wanted to know that the work was done correctly. And uh, my, I, I salute the states that have moved toward not only licensing, but also toward regulation to make it available, information available to the public dealing with uh, mold uh, the, and the, uh, the effects, the bad effects of mold, and then recommending professional organizations not companies in particular, but professional or trade associations that can do training uh, for professionals as a resource for clients to find people who can deal with these mold problems after some type of uh, water event. So we don't hear about the issue like in California as much as we hear about hurricanes when they hit land. But it sounds like they can be just as devastating in many ways. So why is that? Yeah, it, again, these are rare events, Jeff, but they're happening more often now. And mm -hmm. as we said, you know, 25 years, all 58 counties of California have experienced at least one. Uh, the event two weeks ago was a massive storm. You heard you heard the terms used atmospheric river. It doesn't really resonate like it does hurricane, tornado. But yeah, and then we heard bomb cyclone. OK, now we're starting to get into the, the sort of disaster type lexicon of words that actually resonate with people that something is going to happen but what we what doug and i really wanted to emphasize these destructive storms lead to water problems not just the flood so again people focus oh you're in a flood zone that's great no when you get such intense rain you get water in buildings 
and water in buildings leads to, again, dampness, wetness, that leads to microbial contamination. And as Doug said, the struggle we have is people go, oh, I've now got a problem. Where do we find it? California Department of Health has got a, a list of frequently answered questions, which includes the resources available through NORMI to address these problems. So we're trying to make it easier for people to find the, the necessary resources to prepare, but then also to recover from uh, destructive rain events like this one. I think that's a great point that, that Dr. Gavin's making about uh, wind-driven water. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that all those little cracks and crevices in your home is going to allow moisture intrusion. When you get moisture intrusion in any building, uh, you've got the potential for mold growth because there's mold spores lurking around everywhere waiting for a little bit of water. And so I use the illustration sometimes if you think about walking around your house with a, a pump sprayer and spray a little bit of water around the house and then shut down the power for a few days, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to have a mold issue. So he's exactly right. It's not just the flooding, uh, which obviously carries tremendous number of contaminants and microbial issues with Cat 3 water, but uh, also then you've got the wind-driven water that you've got to deal with which is elevating the moisture content inside the house. You know, I hear it all too often that when something like this happens in an area, talking about California today, what happened there, homeowners and professionals are wanting to help, but homeowners, they call their insurance company and they're not, they're not always given the right direction and they don't always get the right help. Let's talk about that. Let's, let's talk about how homeowners can find someone to do the right inspection to dig into the issues, locate the source of the mold or the moisture. And we talked about ISSA and Normie, but specifically those watching this right now, where can they go to get this help? Well, of course they can go to the public health department in uh, Illinois, the public health department in California. Those two states have specifically recommended trade associations uh, like Normie, like the IS, uh, ISCRC where they can find the help that they need. We've provided a website, Normie Pro Environmental Task Force, where there are two documents that they can download. Uh, if they're just simply helping in the process or there are residents, what should they do? There's a lot of information out there. And I think directing them to these individual websites is a really, really smart move. And I, again, I appreciate the public health departments realizing that they can't ignore the issue. Mm -hmm. Gavin, what would you add to that? Yeah, it's really important, Jeff, that we that everyone understands we have the tools and the technologies to be data driven. And what that means is that um, you know most if you've seen water damage to your building, get an indoor air quality monitor. Monitor the air. Also, if you see water damage, if you see growth, if you see discoloration, if you see something that that's not normal, then you know, go back to what Doug was saying, find the professionals and take swabs, get those swabs sent to the laboratory to really work out, are you, am I dealing with a fungi, bacteria? Am I dealing with yeast? Um, what what else grows? Lots of things grow when, when there's dampness and wetness in a building. So really important to not just treat it all with the same, <laughs> with the same brush, but more importantly, you be data driven and go to the specifics. What am I dealing with? And then find the proper solution to deal with what you're actually dealing with. Thank you, Gavin. And Doug, I'd like to close with this question to you. We can go to these departments. We can go to the trade associations. Where the rubber hits the road is when that company shows up in my driveway to do the work. How do I know it's the right company? Because we know that every company is different. How do you know it's the right fit? I think that's a great question. Of course, there are several states, five in fact, that have licensing laws for guys that are dealing with mold, mold assessment, mold remediation. Uh, that leaves a lot of states that don't have any licensing. But I would suppose that the best resource would be for a client to, to find out in one of those states that does have licensing, uh, who are they approving for the training? Who are they approving for the exam? Who are they approving for the certification. And so I think that's a great place to start if you're looking at Louisiana, Florida, District of Columbia, uh, New York, Texas. Those are all states that have licensing laws. Portland, Oregon has a licensing law. Those are places to look and see who are they approving? Because that frankly is where 
uh, Normie gets its credibility. There's not an agency out there saying, oh, this is a credible company. But the states certainly recognize the professional practices that are being uh, taught. They certainly recognize the certification. And then, of course, the next step is not just finding that person, but making sure that they're insured properly, uh, that they can be protected from any potential liability, uh, and making sure that then that the work is done correctly following the standard of care from the ISCRC, professional practices from Normie. So a lot of, a lot of work to be done. Of course, that's part of the pre preparedness we were talking about. Uh, get ready. If you're going to get a flood, you're going to have a problem. You're going to need a solution. You need to make sure that you're using the right person. I like that angle to use those states that have those requirements as models. So companies and states that don't have it can say, we follow the strict guidelines that these others do. Great advice, Doug. I was just going to say, Jeff, one of the interesting things to us is that when we do a class, whether it's in Anaheim, Phoenix, Covington, Florida, wherever it is, we'll have typically a third of our class attendees will be from states that don't require licensing. And the reason is because they know the power of the certification in a state that does require licensing. So I think that's a really, really important step for the professional to realize that having that added credibility is going to put them in a place um, easier for them to compete in the marketplace for the business. Let's get out of crystal ball. Do you see all states or maybe the most of them doing the same thing in years to come? I think that the interesting thing, and Dr. Gavin and I have talked a lot about this in the last couple of years, uh, states that are moving down the licensing path, there's certainly that's certainly going to continue. The issue with that oftentimes is because that's an expensive proposition. They have to create a bureaucracy of some sort, a board or something to manage that. I love the fact that some of these states, uh, like Illinois, like California, have handed put this in the hands of the public health department. Because truthfully, that's where people are going to look for answers. And so seeing states that say, we're going to treat it as a regulation rather than a licensing law, I think is probably the path of least resistance for most of these states. It makes sense to me that that's where it goes, to the public health department. Yeah. Yes. Any final words of advice, Gavin? Um, many of our members from ISSA and also from Normie have already deployed this year to hurricanes. We know they're now deploying to California um, after this severe destructive storm. Um, they need our help. And again, through the Normie ISSA Alliance, our focus is to help people. Can we do better? Yes, we can.